Okay, cool. Um, hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm turning the lights on because I felt it was a bit romantic. <laughs> um, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, my name's Astrid Bin. I'm a, I make games. I'm an, I'm an art and design researcher. I recently just finished my master's degree where I did a, a large-scale game uh, that was delivered by mobile device that you played in public. Uh, that was in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And I'm back here for a couple of months before starting my doctorate in London. Uh, so I'm really engaged in games. I'm really interested in games. And not only video games. I've played video games all my life since, like, dinosaurs roamed the earth in the 80s but also um, play them now and play everything. And I'm here to talk to you today about something called Twine. Does anyone know what Twine is? Has everyone heard of Twine? A few people, yeah? Now, think back to when you were like, I don't know, six maybe, and you played video games and you thought they were amazing and you wanted to make one. Does, any, does everyone remember this? Put your hand up if you remember this. Now, keep your hand up if you made that game. Why not? Uh, a couple keeners, yeah, okay, smart kids. <laughs> um, I had that experience where I wrote a story and it was going to be amazing and I had an Atari 520ST and a graphics program called Dega and I tried to make the art and it was an utter failure and I abandoned the idea and I was really disappointed. And so everyone else, everyone always has this game that they wanted to make that they didn't and it was usually because, for what reasons? You didn't have, didn't know what you were doing. I was six, and I had no idea how to program a computer. Um, I also had no idea how to make art assets. I had no idea what was involved. And so the story I wrote was just kind of, just, you know, died. Um, I'm sure it would be lame anyway, but let's humor my memory. Um, and this is kind of where Twine comes in, is because Twine is a really easy way to make a game. Look, it's Twine. These are my handmade slides. I feel it's important to lower my own credibility when, when doing presentations. I hate slides that make everybody look like they really know what they're talking about. I, you know, I know as much as less than most of you. Um, so how Twine works. Uh, what it is, it's a storytell it's kind of for storytelling. You write this branching story. And it has varying outcomes, and you can kind of like do little offshoots, and then it compiles it into an HTML document, which is super easy to publish on the web or where have you. So it's really easy to make. It requires almost no programming. A six-year-old can do it. And it gives you something that is playable on a million platforms. Now, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is uh, actually my mo the most recent game that I made. I, it wasn't done in Twine, but I used Twine to organize the story. And so you kind of have these little things that, you know, offshoot, and you have this death, death, that's where the game ends, and then there's two win states there. And so that's all it is. It's a way of, you can visually organize a story and have these varying outcomes, and then you hit export, and it, it gives you an HTML, one HTML page that you click through, and it's a super simple game. Now, who remembers these? Yes, choose your own adventure. This is exactly like a choose your own adventure book, uh, which were popular a million years ago, um, where you, you know, if you want to go through the door, turn to page 20. So that's kind of how Twine works. It's very similar to a, um, a choose your own adventure book. Now, Lorenzo, do you have any internet on this? Is there internet in this thing? No, there's no such thing as the internet. Because uh, I can show you the, the Twine game that I made. The first time I went to a game jam, I actually showed up at the Berlin Mini Game Jam, and I'd always been interested in games. I'd made kind of little things, but I'd never made anything proper. And I showed up to the game jam, and I started writing this story. And the themes were everything's on fire, and what was the other themes? I don't even remember. Everything's on fire. Oh, yes. Panic? Pet. No, no, it was... No. It was every, everything's that was, on fire. That was the name of your game. That was the name of my game. Uh, it was everything, everything's on fire and no turning back. Those are the two themes. And so I thought about this story and I thought, well, what can I make? Because I'm not a developer. I'm an artist and a designer. So what do I do? So I, I wrote this story and I thought, well, maybe I can make like a bunch of HTML pages. And I'm sitting there like going, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if I belong here. And Christian was sitting beside me and he's like, you should really use this thing called Twine. It would like really help you out. So that's what I did, and I made this game panic. But this one that only likes when you're Well, I can just explain. You don't want to read all the text anyway. Oh, text, yeah, is no, text is no fun. So what I did was I wrote this game. You're in an office building, and it's on fire, basically. So what do you do? And then get going. Oh, my God, there's a timer. So you've got to make a quick decision. Oh, Lorenzo, click something. Oh, oh my goodness, there's something else. Click it. And the timer's going again. Oh, click it. 
What do you do? Oh, you hey, uh, no, 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 okay, go. Oh, I'm going again. Oh, you're, you're still alive. Hey, I'm waiting. Let's wait. Go again. Oh, I'm, oh I'm, my God, you're still alive. This is amazing. And it... And what does it say? Uh, your adrenaline and any strength you had in your arms is spent. The last thing you feel is your fingers slip from the ledge. You found an efficient way to the ground floor. You plummet to your death. Thank you for playing. So that's kind of what it was. Is this idea of like, how do you force the player to make really fast decisions? And this would have been an utter failure had it not been for this lovely guy called Stefano who came up to me and he said, I, my game really didn't work out. Do you have any need for some JavaScript? I do JavaScript. And I was like, yeah, I could really use a timer. Because that'd be great if you force people to like, have six seconds to make these decisions. You can't even read the text. It doesn't even matter. Just like when you're trying to escape a burning building. And so he made me that little JavaScript timer. And that was my, the first game that I ever finished. And the whole eight hours thing. Berlin Mini Game Jam, if you've never been, go. If you're a seasoned program, if you've never done anything before, if you don't know what you're doing, if you do know what you're doing, they're awesome, and it's such a good way to experiment with ideas, and so I really recommend them. So what happened was, is that I published it online, and uh, this, somebody called Anna Antropy, who's a, a woman who's a games writer, picked it up and reviewed it and got really big on it, and I was like, what? It's really shit. But she's really big on Twine. And so you might be asking, well, okay, great. It's a branching story app. Who cares? You might be saying, so what? Well, here's the thing. Anna Antropy is also kind of a games theorist, and she wrote this book last year. If you've never gotten your hands on it, I really recommend giving it a read. Um, Rise of the Video Game Zinesters, How Freaks, Normals, Amateurs, Artists, Streamers, Dropouts, Queers, Housewives, and People Like You Are Taking Back an Art Form. And it's a really lovely book. It's part history, part manifesto about how games need more creators. And what she says in it is that video games are important to us. People care about them and they, Im they influence us. Also, video games transmit culture and are an art form. They tell stories and people care about the stories that they tell. And also that video games need more creators. So this is kind of, this is really paraphrasing. It's like 300 pages. But this is sort of what it boils down to. And her idea is that video games need more representation. Not only representation of like, you know, people, but also representation of stories. And when I was thinking about representation, I was like, well, what was the first game I ever remember playing? Brace yourselves. It was this. No. Yes, does anyone know what this is? Does, you know, does anyone know? A beer, for if anyone can name this game. No, I'm, you, know, you know, I told you, put your hand down. This is, you might recognize this from the movies. Indiana Jones. It was the Indiana Jones game for the Atari 2600 in 1983 and dinosaurs roamed the earth. The hat gives it away. Exactly. This is a snake. This is another snake. This is a rock. And that's Indiana Jones. So uh, this is, I, I believe, I think the thing was, if I remember correctly, because I, I didn't even get an emulator, because I, I don't really want to spoil my memories of it. But I think this was a basket that moved like that and you had to charm the snake into the basket. If I remember, there's a snake charming scene in Indiana Jones. Anyway, that was what games were when I first started playing games. And I was like, you know, could hardly hold a joystick. And if you look at what games are now, you've got this kind of thing. So that representing Indiana Jones, I'm sure all squares felt a real affinity with Indiana Jones. <laughs> But you have graphics getting super, super realistic, and which is fine. But it does start to represent people much more in a much more real sense than something super abstract like this does. And so that's kind of her point, is that we need more representation because there's a limited amount of stories being told. And that the more people start telling stories through games, the more rich this art form gets, and the more stories are represented. And her point is that, like, she's a transgendered woman, and she's like, when was the last time you played a game by a transgendered woman? Maybe never. She has one on her website. It's, it's actually really good. Um, and so the idea is that this question of representation is really important. So if you give someone something like Twine, which is free, ridiculously easy to use, and is dependent not on graphics but on stories and on narratives, then there's all this new kind of opportunity for representation. Um, she compares it to the zine movement of the 60s, 70s, 80s. I don't know, if, did anyone ever make zines as a teenager? Yes, you know, yeah, good. Uh, so did I. I'm just a teenager, I'm still making them. 
Yes! Keeping it real with the photocopier. I love it. And the reason people made zines was because, especially in the 70s and 80s, when photographic media started, every magazine had photographs and color photographs and hyper-real stuff, then uh, people started, there was people who weren't represented the media. Um, people whose politics weren't mainstream. People whose bodies weren't mainstream. Queer people, fat people, activists, vegetarians, feminists general weirdos, punks, all that kind of stuff, uh, started to take kind of print media and make it their own. And this is kind of what Anna Entropy is saying is happening with games, is that these game making tools are completely available for everybody. So you have all this opportunity to represent yourself and represent your own stories that you may not have had before. Because the barriers to entry to games were until recently really, really high. You had to know how to develop, you had to know how to make art assets. HTML was not a common thing. It was not a common language until about, what, 10 years ago? So there's, there's the barrier to entry is much lower, which is starting to develop the game art form. And the great thing about zines is they were practically free. You can make them with a photocopy or a glue stick, some pens and a stapler. Um, they used available materials. There was nothing high tech about them. There were no barriers to entry. There was no publisher to talk to. You just made it. You didn't ask anybody permission. And then you put it wherever the hell you wanted. I used to put, when I was a teenager, I put mine in the record stores and in um, nightclub bathrooms. That was how I distributed. And more stories were told and voices heard. There's a lot of mainstream magazines now that started out as zines. Does everyone know Vice? Remember Vice? I remember their first issue. <laughs> I'm, I uh, grew up in Toronto, and their first issue was like, it was exactly like a zine. I was so excited, and then I was so disappointed years later. But, um, <laughs> uh, but the point is, is that when you have low barriers to entry, then of course all this other stuff can happen by people who would normally not have access to this stuff. And this is what Twine is, and this is why Twine is a really interesting kind of thing. It's free. Um, it pumps out HTML, which, I mean, most people know how to use, and if you don't, somebody around you does. It requires no programming, like, really, a six-year-old can do it. If I can do it, anybody can. And it's available to everyone. So it has this kind of, this kind of parallel with scenes. So games are starting to get more exciting because people can, anybody can publish. And so I showed up at a game jam with doing some, knowing some CSS, HTML, a little bit of JavaScript and going, oh, what do I do? And then was able to pump out something that was cohesive and finished in eight hours, showing up with pretty much no skills at all. Now, if you want to get Twine, uh, it's got the stupidest URL, but it's gimcracked, no e, dot com slash src source slash et cetera, etc. But if you uh, Google Twine games, blah, 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 you can get it there. Anna Entropy is somebody that's actually worth, she writes a lot, and her stuff's really worth reading. That book is excellent. It, it's really good. Uh, she's at antipixelanti.com. And if you want to get me on Twitter, I am disastered. But um, those are the important ones. But thanks, that's all really I have to say.